my extreme pleasure to introduce my uh, old friend and uh, um, maybe even hopefully someday collaborator, we'll see uh, Marcus Pelger, who's a professor at Stanford University. He's going to talk to us about a recent paper uh, called Deep Learning Statistical Arbitrage. So I will put myself on mute and hand off to Marcus. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I hope to see you all in person soon again. So this paper here is joint work with my PhD students, Jorge Giaro Ordones and Greg Zanotti, who are both from Stanford. And by the way, please interrupt me if you have any questions or comments. Uh, so this paper is about statistical arbitrage. And just to provide some intuition, I would like to start with a simple example, which would be pairs trading. And the idea is to identify two similar stocks. I will take as an example here, General Motors and Ford. And the assumption is that prices of similar stocks should be on average similar and temporal price differences could be exploited by this arbitrage strategy because similar assets should on average have similar prices and everything that deviates has to be temporary. So if you would like to run a statistical arbitrage strategy, there are essentially these three elements included. So let's have a look here on this plot where I show you the cumulative returns of GM and Ford. And you see that indeed these prices seem to be very closely related. I could construct a long short portfolio, which would just buy GM and sell Ford. I'm showing you a plot on the right. This would be a residual process. And, if I, and indeed, this seems to be a mean reverting process. So when the price of Ford becomes much higher than of GM, we see that the, this difference seems to mean revert and there seems to be a correction going on. Now, I would like to exploit it. I would need to estimate a statistical model. For example, the speed of mean reversion of this residual process. And if I would like to exploit it, I need some kind of trading policy. This could be a threshold rule. If this um, deviation from zero is sufficiently large, I buy the cheap stock and I sell the expensive stock. Now, these elements are more generally part of a statistical arbitrage problem. So general statistical arbitrage also has these elements of creating arbitrage portfolios. So we need to find a way to generate long short portfolios of similar assets. Then we would like to extract an arbitrage signal. That means essentially we want to estimate a time series pattern from for these temporary price deviations. And then we need a trading rule. So this will be our arbitrage allocation. Now this is a challenging problem because we don't only want to take to trade two stocks, but we would like to trade all stocks. So in my empirical study, I will trade the 500 largest stocks in the US. And because I have so many assets and I do not know what constitutes similar assets, I need a data-driven way to solve this problem. Second, um, we know that stock returns have complex time series patterns and the same holds for these temporary price deviations. So we need to be able to fit a quite complex time series model. And third, if we want to trade, well, the complex time series pattern will also result in complex trading rules and those should depend on the actual objectives that we have in mind. Now, can machine learning help here? So when we talk about machine learning, we mean methods that are flexible, that means they're non-parametric, and that they can deal with many variables because of some form of regularization. Now, the issue is that, um, as you all know, that financial data, for example, stock return data has a low signal to noise ratio. So the signal that we care about is hard to detect, and another important element is that the problem that we are facing here is not a simple prediction problem. So what we show is that if you set up the problem in the right way, so you impose a certain amount of structure, you will be able to find the, the important signal in the data that allows you to take advantage of these temporary price deviations. So more, so more generally, the kind of questions that we want to answer here are, first, what is a good arbitrage strategy. But more specifically, I have presented these three key elements of arbitrage trading, and I would like to know what matters actually, right? What is a good way to get arbitrage portfolios? What are the signals in the data? And how should it trade on them? And then the empirical question is, how much realistic arbitrage is actually in financial markets? And we are going to provide answers to both of these questions. So we have two methodological contributions in this paper. 
So as the title of the paper suggests, deep learning statistical arbitrage, we are going to develop a new method, which is based on a machine learning tool called deep neural networks. And more specifically, our deep learning statistical arbitrage has a very specific solution for these three elements that I've outlined before. We will use statistical factor models, conditional statistical factor models to identify similar assets that we use to generate these arbitrage portfolios. Then we are going to use the most advanced AI for natural language and processing to extract this time series signal. This will be a so-called convolutional neural network with a transformer. You can think of this as a very flexible data-driven time series filter that can learn any complex time series pattern. Now, I just want to highlight again, these transformers are really the state of the art when it comes to dealing with um, NLP data. So if you have text data or speech data, this also corresponds to a time series. And we know that text data is really hard to work with because if I have a paragraph, the meaning of the last word in the paragraph can depend on the very first word in the paragraph. So it's these dependencies in this time series that matter, and these transformers are specifically designed to extract complex time series patterns. Then we will use a flexible non-parametric allocation rule, which is based on a neural network, to map the signal into a trading rule. You can think of this as a generalization of a conventional optimal stopping rule for investment. And all of this is integrated based on a global economic objective, namely to maximize risk-adjusted returns under constraints. Now, this is our solution that we present, but we also present a new conceptual framework by introducing these three elements of arbitrage portfolio generation, signal extraction, and allocation, which we can use to map all existing arbitrage portfolio um, methods in there and to study what matters actually. So we can study each component and we can then make a statement about what is the challenging problem? Where is actually the benefit of using flexible methods and what are simple problems? We have a very comprehensive empirical study uh, based on US equities. So we are going to use daily returns for 19 years of the 500 largest, most liquid stocks. We will consider the most empirically most important risk factor models to construct our arbitrage portfolios. And then we use our novel deep learning arbitrage strategy and compare it with uh, various parametric and non-parametric existing models out there. We show that we get an excellent out of sample performance with our new model. So we claim it will provide the new benchmark in the literature because it substantially outperforms all the other benchmark models. Our arbitrage strategies achieve annual out of sample sharp ratios of four, we can achieve annual returns of around 20% while having a volatility that is less than 6%. We show that our arbitrage strategies are uncorrelated with conventional risk factors or market movements. And importantly, they survive realistic transaction and holding costs. And we have tons of robustness tests and we show that our results are stable over time and very robust to all kinds of choices and tuning parameters that we have made here. But now what matters actually for arbitrage trading? So if you look at the literature, there's a lot of emphasis on finding methods to identify similar stocks. Now we show that this is really not the hard problem. So once you have um, a good factor model to identify similar assets, um, you get very similar results. So this means if you use a pharma French model, the principal component based model, conditional statistical factor model, once you have sufficiently many factors extracted, those models will perform very similarly. So that is not the big problem. The really important distinguishing factor is how we deal with a time series signal. And that is where we need a sophisticated way to identify what are the time series pattern. So our transformer method performs four times better than the best parametric model that's out there and twice as well as a leading non-parametric model. So this is really the, the difference. And the second element that matters, as we will show, is that you need the right objective function when you estimate these models. So to make it very simple, if you care about a signal for trading, you need a trading objective. It's just different from a prediction problem, for example. 
but we also learn about the economic structure. I mean, what is our arbitrageur actually doing? What is he or she trying to exploit? So we show that our arbitrageur, she's trying to exploit smooth trend in mean reversion patterns, but she's using an asymmetric policy. She will react very fast on downtrends, but she will be more cautious when there's an uptrend in the data. Just to put it into the literature, um, obviously there has been a lot of work on the idea of statistical arbitrage and how to exploit it. Now there's a, the majority of this work uses various parametric models. For example, this work specifies a specific stochastic process um, and then solves for the estimates the parameters and derives a parametric um, allocation rule. So I, what I want to highlight is our model is fully non-parametric but we are going to include the best, the empirically best performing model out of this literature, which is the Avalanada and Lee paper and an extension by Yo and Papa Nicolau, and that will be our parametric benchmark. Now there's a lot of interest at the moment in using machine learning tools in finance, and most of the tools using asset pricing are used to explain the risk premium of assets. So it it's explains the exposure to systematic risk but our model is exactly trying to explain patterns that is orthogonal to that component. So in some way, after you have taken out the systematic component, we are trying to identify what are the temporal deviations around it. So in this sense, our work is complementary. Now, other work that you see in the literature is essentially based on prediction problems. Some of this work is also using time series data for prediction. Just want to highlight predictions, a different problem and is not the solution for arbitrage trading. I will provide more details later, but fundamentally when you do prediction, you're mixing a risk premium and an arbitrage element. And given the low signal to noise ratio in return data, prediction methods have a very hard time to identify structure. Let me start with the model. So we'll start with a standard factor model. So this will be a conditional factor model so I have N stocks. Let's for the moment think I have 500 stocks and I observe them over time. Now assume I have a factor component given by K factors and some residual. Now the loadings, which I denote by beta, capture the exposure to my factors. Now importantly, my betas can be general functions of my information set and can be time varying. So I'm not assuming a constant beta for my factors, but they can change over time because for example, the characteristics of my stocks can change over time. Now, the key idea here is that factors identify similar assets by similar exposure to risk factors. Now my arbitrage portfolios will simply be residual portfolios. That means the factor model essentially gives me the fair price of an asset. After I subtract the factor fair price, I end up with a residual. And under arbitrage pricing theory, the unconditional mean of these residuals should be zero. So what we are trying to exploit now will be temporal price deviations around this fair factor price. Now the type of factors that we are going to use will be observed fundamental factors like a market factor, from a French factors, et cetera. We are going to estimate statistical factors with principal component analysis. We are going to do this on local windows. And we will use an extension of principal component analysis with this um, instrumented principal component analysis, where these loadings can be functions of other variables, namely firm specific characteristics, which can be time varying. For example, the size of a company, the book to market ratio, et cetera. Now without a lot of generality, we can assume that our factors are traded. That means there's a portfolio that we can, uh, there are portfolio weights that we can, that we know, that we can use to express our factors as a portfolio of all the underlying assets. Now, in the case of observed fundamental factors, we know this portfolio is. So we know how to construct a market factor or a size factor. When we do PCA estimation, we get these portfolio weights as part of the estimation. Um, the same for- Hey, hey Marcus. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I wanna make good on my promise to interrupt. So yes. when you say we can assume these uh, factor portfolios are traded. Well, wh mm -hmm. Why do you say that? I mean, a, like a size factor usually has like a million long short exposures mm -hmm. that you know, change pretty rapidly. Uh, I mean, that, that would be very expensive to trade with all the shorting costs and stuff. Oh, you know? 
we will talk more about this element, but from a purely conceptual point of view to start with, when I have factors where I know the portfolio weights, I can express them as a portfolio of my underlying um, asset space. And if these are non-traded factors, I can project them on my asset space to get factor mimicking portfolios. Yes. So that is, so that is I'm right there with you. We have uh, those factor mimicking portfolios, but I don't think that they're, I don't, I don't think they're so easy to trade. Now we will talk more about it when it comes to trading frictions and we can talk about what I could call proxy factors because I can approximate a lot of factors by not trading all stocks, but only a subset of stocks. But here I just want to start with a conceptual point of view. That okay. I start with my factors as traded assets. And, and by the way, I mean, if you think about size or value factors, you could argue there are ETFs out there that capture some of those elements. So you could actually buy proxies based on other traded assets, but that's not the point. Um, and just, if, I will show that the factors that I will concentrate on will be these latent factors like PCA or IPCA. And mm -hmm. those have a very clean projection to my asset space. So um, that is a very- I, I all right. Well, I'm not sure I got my, I, I believe you can make a, a good factor mimicking portfolio. I'm just not so sure that um, that portfolio is so easy to trade. So that the, my objection is in the second piece and not in the first piece. Okay. Um, we will talk, I promise I will come back to um, considerations about turnover, short selling, trading frictions. Thank you. The point here is that my residual is in the end, you know, return minus this fair price pro, um, given by the factors. If I express my factors um, as a portfolio, I can express my residuals as a portfolio of the underlying assets. And the choice of a factor model corresponds to a projection matrix. I just call it phi here, but given a choice of factor model, I get a matrix that I use to construct my residuals. So that is, so there's a clear mapping between a portfolio of residuals and the underlying stock returns. So what I will get is for my 500 stocks for a specific choice of factor model, I will get 500 residuals. Now those are by construction um, factor neutral, at least to the factors I used to construct the residuals. And we show empirically that these residuals are only very weakly correlated and will be actually mean reverting um, over time. All right, so let's say we have our 500 residuals given a choice of factor model. Now I will take a look back window. Let's say I take the last 30 days and I can look at the cumulative returns of my residuals. And what I want to extract now will be a signal. For example, I want to identify is this a fast mean reverting process or a slow mean reverting process. And based on that signal, I define a trading rule. For example, I trade a fast mean reverting process different from a slow mean reverting process. Now, mathematically, the problem is the following. Um, so given the cumulative returns of my residuals, I want to find a function. I call this the arbitrary signals function. So I plug in one vector, which would be this 30 dimensional vector for a specific residual. And then it gives me the signal. For example, it tells me this is a high or a low mean reverting process, right? That would be a vector of signals. But I'm using the same function that I apply to all of my 500 residuals. And then giving the signal, I decide how I trade it. This is mathematically an allocation function. So given a vector of signals, I apply this function and it tells me the portfolio weight that I assign to it, by cell and by how much, right? And again, the important thing is I apply the same function to all my 500 signal vectors. Now I need an objective function to estimate all of this. And now here, what's important is we need an economic objective. So the main example I'm going to use for this talk will be a sharp ratio objective, but we consider more general framework in the paper and we also have results for other objective functions. So here's the thing. So given my 500 residuals, I get, I've asked, I want to estimate my signal function and my allocation function that gives me my residual weights. This will be a 500 dimensional vector, how much I trade each residual. Now, given the mapping that I have between residuals and the original returns, 
I get the weights in the original return space, and then I can trade all my 500 stocks, and I want this portfolio to have a high Sharpe ratio, right? High expected return divided by standard deviation. So this is my Sharpe ratio objective. Now, we will show how to also include trading costs and other friction with the objective function later, but I start with this here for the moment. Now, I just want to emphasize, we use an implicit leverage constraint here because we uh, have an L1 constraint on the stock weights. So in absolute value, they have to sum up to one. That means at most we have one half percent leverage. Um, now, we will have three key model classes to estimate the signal function and location function. Marcus, can I ask a question? Yes, please. So um, if you have this leverage constraint, then maximizing sharp ratio might not be a very good thing to do because you might have a terrific sharp ratio, but very low volatility and low return. Um, 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 Perfect. You're two slides ahead of me. Okay. Um, short answer. So here we show how much sharp ratio mean you can get with a leverage constraint. But if your objective is to get a high mean return, you should have a different objective function. And we show how much that matters and what the implications are for that. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so just to clarify. So there will be three comparisons. One will be parametric models. That means you specify a time series model and you specify a parametric rule how to trade the signals on that. The second one will be non-parametric models, but you pre-specify the class. So you pre-specify what we'll call a time series filter and the class for the allocation rules. And the third one will be our novel idea of this deep learning arbitrage, which mathematically is a data-driven time series filter and a non-parametric allocation rule. And then we want to understand what matters actually. So this here provides- Marcus, Marcus, uh, could I just ask yes. a question? Uh, and it's partially, about um, trading costs, which you can come back later um, to, but would it be possible to also have a constraint on how much turnover you Perfect. have? That now will be part of it. We will add a term here, trading friction costs, which will have turnover, short selling constraints. And I show you how an arbitrageur changes how they trade if they have to face trading costs because they will trade differently. So uh, trading costs here are not, not just direct um, trading costs in terms of how much you have to pay for the trade, mm -hmm. but also potentially other issues. So we only consider short selling costs. So short selling positions are more expensive than long positions and turnover. So if um, mm -hmm. there will be five basis points for each trade, we don't have something like market impact. So we just use the largest stocks and hope that this means that market impact is not um, a primary concern. Um, well, but it depends how big the fund is, right? How big the uh, yes. So, so uh, can you implement a um, a strict tr um, turnover constraint in your model? So not like some average or something, but a, I don't want to have more than X percent turnover on average. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. It could be just. Um, a constraint that we impose in here yep. in this optimization function. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some uh, slight technical elements when you do this type of optimization, if you want a hard or right. a soft <laughs> penalty, right. but right. if you neglect these details, um, okay. there will be a point that I want to make. Um, this is a bigger picture point because you see some papers out there that say a machine learning is good on paper, but not in reality because um, um, trading costs eat everything up. And then they run some form of machine learning estimation without trading costs. Then you evaluate later how much trading costs would you have with that. And our point is that is not the right perspective because no, the model will extract very different signals if it knows it should avoid certain positions. Yeah. Um, and, and we want to interpret that. What, what, uh, where do the differences come from later? Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Great. Um, to give you a little bit more intuition, this is a standard parametric model. So this is how the literature has to a large extent historically looked at these type of problems. You assume a mean reverting process for the residuals. This is an Onsted-Ullenbeck process as one example. 
Then you estimate the parameters of this process. This is done with uh, maximum likelihood estimation, for example. So this will be a speed of mean reversion, the kind of drift and the volatility. And then we use a rule. This will be the threshold rule derived by Avalanida and Lee, which essentially says, if your last point is above a certain threshold, you short sell. If it's below a certain threshold, you, you, you buy. And if you're in some middle range, you're, you stay neutral. So this would be a conventional parametric model. And you know, as any parametric model, you have always the same issue. What happens if it's misspecified, right? For example, if for the local window that I look, it looks more like a trend than a mean reverting process, this is a very bad model to model that. What if there are two frequencies of mean reversion? There's only one parameter here, so obviously you will have misspecification. Um, and the same with the allocation function, that might be too restrictive. So the next way would be to go non-parametric. Um, and the way how we should think about the problem, we argue that time series filter uh, perspective. So when we estimate this on and on back process in discrete time, we essentially apply a time series filter to the data. So our parameters is what we get after applying a time series filter. So what we say is, well, we should just apply a more general time series filter to our vector of, um, so, you know, for each residue, I have a 30 dimensional vector. I apply a 30 by 30 matrix and the output of that I call my filter time series. Um, ARMA models are just special cases of a specific type of filter. Now, because we care about mean reversion patterns, frequency filters are the natural choice here. So what you propose is a fast rate transformation of the data. That means we represent the data in the frequency space. So intuitively, this looks like we have like time series factors like sinus and cosinus functions is like a factor. And the loadings on these factors are the FFT transformation. These, these coefficients will be our signals. So we will know if a certain residual is more like a long reversal or short-term reversal signal because the loadings on the corresponding sinus or cosinus would be different. Okay, once we know these signals, we want to trade on them. And because it's less obvious here how you trade on these kind of MFT coefficients, we use a non-parametric model, more specifically a so-called feed-forward neural network. Think of this just as a non-parametric estimator. It's a very flexible non-parametric estimator. And so our allocation, what we buy, what we sell, is based on applying an FFT on the FFT transformation of our residuals. Now, the shortcoming here is again, we can only capture what we allow our filter to detect, right? So if certain time series patterns are more complex than an FFT can detect, we will not be able to exploit it. And now here comes our model. This is this convolutional transformer. And it has two elements, as the name says. It uses something called convolutional neural networks. And these can be sort as data-driven nonlinear local filters. And then it has this transformer. So a transformer learns a global dependency between these local filters. So intuitively, a CNM plus transformer is a flexible nonlinear filter that can learn any time series pattern. For example, if we want to learn a trend, the CNN might detect local drifts and then the transformer puts these local drifts monotonically together to get a global drift. If we have a mean reversion pattern, the CNN learns local curvatures and then the transformer combines them as a, a in a cyclical pattern to get some global mean reversion. And our signal will essentially be the exposure to these pattern factors. And given this exposure, our signals, we use the same flexible feed forward network as before to get an allocation rule, right? So the only difference to what I described before is that we extract the time series signal in a data-driven way here. And then we use this trading objective, either sharp ratio or mean variance optimization or um, trading objective is transaction costs to estimate the signal and allocation function. Just to give a little bit more intuition, I give you here a very simplified version of CNN and transformer, but it has all the key elements in it. So let's say I have one residual. So there's a vector with 30 elements. Now a CNN estimates in a data-driven way, many local filters. So these will be examples of the empirical filters that we estimate in the data. 
So this will be local upward trends, local downward trends, and local reversal type patterns. And we apply this to our time series, and we essentially get the exposure to these local filters. Um, we will have eight of these local filters, and it was based on the data. And so we represent one vector of, uh, that has 30 elements as a matrix, which will be a 30 times eight. Just tells you if locally you're more exposed to upward or downward trends or reversion patterns. And now we need to combine these local patterns to something global. That's what a transformer is going to do. Now, the magic of a transformer takes place in the so-called attention function or in the attention weights. So more specifically, there will be H attention weights. In our case, there will be four. So each attention weight captures a different global pattern. So we'll have four global patterns intuitively. And we, the transformer estimates a so-called attention function, I call it alpha. And the attention function measures the dependency that the last observed um, residual value has with all the previous values. Now the input here are the CNN's transformed versions of the residuals. And the trick is again, how this attention function is estimated, right? So this could estimate something that looks more like a trend or a reversion type pattern. And then the loadings to these pattern factors, I call them H, these are my signals. Now I have four um, global patterns. So I will get four signals out of this here. And then I trade based on this. Is this my residual is more similar to a specific type of pattern or another type of pattern? All right, let's come to the interesting part, which are the empirical results. Marcus, uh, yes. can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Um, so typically when you uh, introduce a new method, you tell stories or this works well and so on and so on. But can you tell, give me some intuition when this model will not work well? So what are the trade-offs here between this two-step model versus maybe other simpler models, there must be cases where this definitely works better and others where it works worse. So in, which would be an example where this would not, would not work as well as other methods? So that's a good question. Um, this here is strictly more general than if I pre-specify, for example, the FFT a priori. So but not, in a, not, not in a finite sample, right? So exactly, so the problem, principle that arises is um, more flexible models have intuitively more parameters. More parameters means more noise in estimation. If you have way too many parameters, you have overfitting if you have a small data set. So the challenge is, and that's actually a very good point that you have raised. Um, thanks for putting it, pointing this out. The challenge when you work with time series data is that um, you have a lot of potential parameters because you care about dependencies between the points. And transformers come from NLP, from natural language and data, uh, from, net, from, from text and speech data, which also has the issue. These are extremely complex dependencies. And if you want to model everything, you have way too many parameters. In particular, in our case, when the data sets are small, relatively small, you need to impose a lot of structure to make things work. And there is, uh, that is kind of the magic of this transformer that it imposes this type of, I call it factor model, but uh, in quotation marks, because it's a little bit different, mm -hmm. but it has an element of a factor model. It imposes a low dimensional structure on the data. So putting it simple, there should be a small number of global patterns um, and if there are many, many global patterns, that might be an issue here, because there is this idea that intuitively four global patterns describe the data. Um, I mean, the number four is estimated from the data, but the point is a small number. Um, the other element that um, matters is that, um, I, I just want to highlight it. We don't care when we look at these cumulative residuals about their absolute values. We only care about relative movements. So we don't care if something yeah. is 30 or 40, but we care if something changed from 30 to 31 or from 20 to 21. So this model has to be about relative changes. So the idea of using a CNN is essentially first to make local relative, uh, express the data as local relative uh, data points. 
and then see if these local relative data points have some global dependency. The, I, I will dig deeper in the type of structure that we detect. I mean, my, I don't have a perfect answer to your question. My, a cheap answer is just to say, well, um, if we have very little data, then a more flexible model always runs into issues because you're trying to estimate too much. We impose some kind of structure. If this type of structure, in terms of a small number of global patterns, is misspecified, this is not going to work well. Um, I think that would be so my cheap answer. Let me ask you a similar question in a slightly different way. Let's say they are, if the true model is just, let's say you have some sort of co-integration and mm -hmm. that's the true model, okay? Mm -hmm. um, how much, oh, how would this model work in a finite sample if the true model is really simple? So we have simulations and I will have a lot of empirical data. And my point is, if you have the type of, so we have 500 cross-sectional data points and we look at 1000 days. That seems to be sufficient to work in simulation and empirically very well. We have not looked at much smaller samples. So I would, it depends. Mm -hmm. So another example in simulation, if I use a sinus function, to create my residuals, then FFT will work really, really well. well Our models will not true. work as well as FFT. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, sure. it depends. Um, I think and what might be useful to add here, we use a so-called one layer transformer. That means we use a really, really shallow setup mm -hmm. with very, very small number of parameters. I mean, this is not like, um, so transformers are famous uh, by something called BERT, Google introduces, that's a standard for all kind of NLP data. Those transformers have six layers and thousands of parameters. Ours is a tiny, tiny, tiny version of that because we have very little data. Um, so so I, I, again, I don't want to mm -hmm. take too much time, but if you had a situation where, uh, I mean, you apply this to all the stocks, right? So if you mm -hmm. had for some stocks, a, uh, a simpler model would be sufficient. And for other stocks, you need this fancy, uh, mm -hmm. this estimator. Yeah. Um, so in some sense, it's overkill for, I don't know, a good portion of the sample, while for others, it is really important. And I think you're gonna come back to, to mm -hmm. this later on is, so, where do where do the trading profits come from? What aspect of this transformer is really crucial? Um, and is it um, is are the trading profits concentrated in those stocks um, where you have you actually need this transformer? What as opposed to other stocks where you don't need it in some sense? I will go into depth into interpreting okay. what we get. My short okay. answer is, what, what, where do other models fail? So I have example plots. Yeah. This transformer looks at very short-term patterns, like in a two, one to two, three day window. The other models are not catching any of that. So, so it seems like very short-term type of fast changing patterns, you get with this here quite well, and the others neglect it. And that okay. seems to be certainly one source of, Okay, but what if you just, let's say, use weekly data or even monthly data and you use this transformer um, and compare it to other methods? You would essentially lose all of the, at what frequency? I mean, again, you, you can come back to this later on. I don't wanna, uh, yeah. you know. So if you wanna come, uh, come back, I, I love, that's fine. I love this question. Um, I should mention Greg is right now re-estimating everything if we only do weekly trading, because we want to know is all the arbitrage profitability that we get, does it come from trading daily or, or so is there arbitrage left on a weekly horizon? So let's, let's talk about it after the results. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. So let me come to the data. 90 years, daily stock returns. We only take stocks with a 
prior market cap larger 0.01% of total market cap. On average, 550 larger stocks. So think about we trade the S&P 500. Um, we use also for this conditional latent factor model 46 monthly characteristics. Um, all results will be out of sample. So the main model I'm going to present, will look at the last 30 days to get this trading signal and to decide which residual to buy or sell. But I show you what happens if you look at longer windows. Um, our models will be estimated on four years. So this is roughly 1000 days of data. And we re-estimate them every half a year with so rolling window estimation. For the factor models, um, we estimate these betas for, let's say, pharma French factors or PCA factors using a rolling window of 60 days. And this is out of sample. So that means I look at day T minus one up to day T minus 60 to run this regression to get my beta and then use this beta to get an out of sample residual. So this is a tradable residual. So the main analysis looks at sharp ratio, but I will compare other objective functions. So we get residuals with a market factor, pharma French three factor models with size and value. We add investment profitability. We also add momentum, short term, and long term reversal. So one to eight observed factors. We estimate. Uh, Mark, are, are you seeing intraday data in these estimations? Daily. That is close to close returns. Daily. So. So you, um, then, then T is pretty small. Um, so T, so the point is we have 500 residuals over if I have four years, 1000 days. And the point is I estimate one function that I apply to all of these residuals because I first take out all other sources of commonality. So the, the data is orthogonal to characteristic essentially. Okay, can you go back to the last slide for a second? So so I, I agree daily in four years, that sounds reasonable, but you've got 30 days and 60 days. So oh. um, what's, what's, uh, what's up with those horizons? Okay, so we estimate a function using 500 times 1000 data points, right? That's like 500 residuals for four years. No. This function uses as an input the last 30 days. Or we will show what happens if you use the last 60 days. Okay, yeah. Um, so there's a difference between what is information we use and what yeah. is the training data. Thank you. Great. Um, just to mention for PCA factors, we estimate on a rolling window using the last six months daily data. And then we construct out of sample residuals to one to 15 PCA factors. Same approach for IPCA, that's Kelly, Cruz, and Sue's model, where loadings are factors of uh, are function of characteristics. We also look at what happens if you just take original stocks instead of residuals and you apply all these trading rules to those. And then I compare these three models, right? There will be a parametric model with a parametric rule, a non parametric filter with a non parametric rule, and our data driven filter with a data driven <laughs> rule, right? And just for comparison, completeness, what happens if you estimate a parametric model, but instead of a threshold rule, you plug, you estimate a feed forward neural network for the allocation. Or if you do not apply a time series filter and you just apply a feed forward neural network to residuals to trade, we look into all these combinations. Now this small table is actually the main result of the empirics. So I want to go through this carefully. What am I going to show here? Well, I will look at annual sharp ratios out of sample, annual means and annual volatilities of the different strategies. I will look at residuals from Pharma French, PCA or IPCA. Here is a number of factors I use. I look at the zero factor model and the five factor model. I will look at the different number of factors on the next slide. So I just want to keep this simple here. And I look at uh, data driven, our benchmark model, uh, the pre-specified filter and the parametric model. Now, if you look at annualized sharp ratio with IPCA residuals of our model, it's over four, right? That's amazing. Um, um, this would be twice as good as if what, what you would get with um, a pre-specified filter. And if you use a parametric model, you get a sharp ratio of one, which is not bad actually, right? It's still a sizable number. 
but you can see there's a difference of a factor of two or four. So just keep in mind, the pre-specified filter uses the same flexibility for the allocation rule, but we see a doubling in sharp ratios, right? So it seems to be important to extract a, a flexible time series model. Second takeaway, what happens if we just use return instead of residuals? All models will collapse essentially. They will perform substantially worse. And that makes sense if you think more carefully about it. Because we are trying to estimate a complex time series model. If I assume five factors describe my, times, my, my returns, then essentially 500 returns are not 500 independent return time series. They're essentially only five time series. This is not a lot of data to estimate a model from. There's another more subtle point that has to do, we cannot really predict levels in the data. When I look at residuals, I essentially take out the level component and I look at relative performances. And that is the part where we have much more predictability in the data, right? So second takeaway, you need to use residuals as an input. Um, now, the mean returns can be large, up to 15%, in spite of having a leverage constraint. So it goes back to Bob's point from before. Um, so overall, this shows that our model seems to be a new benchmark if you look at sharp ratios. Now, what about the number of factors? Now, this is the same table as before, but before I had only zero and five factors. Now I show you for all models, zero to 15 factors. What you can see is if I go from a five factor to eight, 10, 15, nothing changes. And that is very per consistent among all the models. So essentially the takeaway is once I have extracted sufficiently many factors, the results are very similar, right? So it seems three to five factors are needed. After that, it doesn't really matter anymore. We also observe that if I use conditional latent factors or PCA factors, or Fama French factors, the results, I mean, they're not exactly the same, but I get quite good results. So the, 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 diff, the, the, the difference in the model is not really coming from the number of factors or the, which factor model I use. Uh, it's really coming from how do I extract my signal and how do I trade on it? So that is a distinguishing element. So just to clarify, here I take five factors. Yes, please. Marcus, uh, again, if you're going to talk about this, um, you can uh, defer. Uh, but here you, you're using a lot of stocks in the way, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about these PCA models too, uh, what, what happens if you use fewer stocks? Is this is the advantage of this um, CNN transform model because you have a lot of stocks? Um, or another, another question would be if you take... Uh, only like the extreme stocks in the uh, relative to the factor model. Mm -hmm. um, how would would these other methods that are simpler uh, do relatively better for a smaller universe of stocks, or do you or not? This is a good question. We have. I need to look into that. One thing I can tell you: I've looked into the allocation rates and. There, there are no outliers. So it seems like it's trading, it's a well diversified portfolio that trades in most stocks at the same time with quite similar weights in terms of magnitude. So this would speak for it's taking advantage of the whole universe, but I have not looked at either evaluating or estimating models on a smaller subset. That's a good point. I mean, in principle, if you, let, let's say you have two stocks, mm -hmm. take, your, take your Ford and GM model. Yeah, that you had at the outset, right? That would be the extreme model, right? Um, you know how? Again, I'm just trying to understand mm -hmm. how how this model works. I mean, that, that's that's one dimension that might be important. That's true. Yeah, I, we need to look into that. So we have a lot of robustness or details into certain questions, but we have not looked into that question yet. We will do that. Thanks. And. Can just remind me too, how many factors are you using for the PCA, IPCA models? So I have here K, the number of uh, factors. The, okay, so that, that's the factors are uh, the PCA factors or the factors in the CNN transform model? Oh, um, I was a little bit silent about the tuning parameters of these models. So the CNN transformer will have four uh, pattern factors. 
uh, based on a validation that we did. Um, so we selected this based on the validation data. No, um, that's fine. What I'm asking is, um, like, it's, take the Pharma French, for example. Um, yeah. The Pharma French model is three-factor model. So the, the different cases are different, different uh, factors in the CNN transformer model, right? No, these here are um, CAPM, Pharma French 3, Pharma French 5, Pharma French Oh, I see. Oh, so I see. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Principal component with one up to fifteen principal component factors. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I so, misunderstood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So this point was only about how do we construct arbitrage portfolios? What matters for that? And my claim is mm -hmm. this is a simple problem in some way. Um, you can use a lot of different factor models, and you kind of get relatively similar results. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not the hard problem. Um, just one point, if I take five latent factors, this could be five IPC factors, five PCA factors, or take the Pharma French five factor model. And then I look at the cumulative returns of the strategies out of sample. Um, I get these different variations. My point is that our models do just consistently well out of sample. They're not big losses. So it's if I use different risk metrics like uh, max loss, et cetera, we would do well along all these different categories. And it's not that a particular time period drives all our results. We can look at different sub periods and we will get quite similar results. This is different if you look at simple parametric models where you can argue they get a lot of their performance during the financial crisis, for example. Um, so there's a difference in that respect. Okay. Well, our, our, our portfolio is just loading on existing risk premia. So the next step would be to look at alphas. It means pricing errors relative to um, uh, well-known factors. So here we take eight asset pricing factors, which would be Pharma French 5 plus momentum, short-term and long-term reversal, because those are based on price trends. And we will look at our out-of-sample returns from the strategies and look at the pricing error relative to these factor models. That's our alpha. We report the T statistics of these alphas. And also the time series are squared because we care about how much variation do we actually capture. Now, if I look, for example, here at PCA, um, the alphas are essentially the same as the mean return that I get from the residuals. So there's not much I capture with my factors here in this uh, pricing error regression. The T stats of alphas and means are essentially the same, highly significant. The R squared of these residuals, what is explained, it's around 1% for PCA. That means 99% of the variation is not explained by these eight factors because these are residuals, right? By construction, it should be close to orthogonal to existing factors. So we just confirm this here, right? So it's not an alpha that we get. So it's essentially orthogonal to existing sources of risk. And we can do the same exercise with other risk factors with the same results. Now, I just want to highlight again, if I would look at different number of factors, so not only five factors, but also eight or 10, 15. Marcus, um, yes? Uh, quick question. So mm -hmm. since you're using lag, um, lag signals, mm -hmm. Is there an element of momentum trading in here? But not just absolute momentum, but momentum in terms of a benchmark, a benchmark factor model. So do you have do you have momentum in any of these, uh, like in the former French model? So we use, um, as an eight factor model, we included price trends, which is a short term right. reversal and a momentum factor. Yes, so, so, you know. That means this residual here yeah. is orthogonal to these conventional uh, price trend factors. Right, so I'm just, I mean, in some sense, your trading strategy is a momentum trading strategy, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it might, be, it might be useful to sort of tease that out a little bit more, specifically how your momentum um, strategy is different from the traditional momentum strategy, right? It's, it's uh, but in principle, this is a momentum strategy strategy what you're impl implementing here i will right. show you an interpretation and uh, it's a very short-term momentum and a very short-term reversal and this will be different from 
the conventional momentum, which is just based on much longer horizons. Um, so it looks at returns many months in the past, while we look at a much shorter window in the end. Um, but then, then I think a good, good benchmark model would, if you just implement uh, um, the shorter momentum strategy in an ad hoc way, mm -hmm. right? So not as fancy as is just sort of define a simple high frequency momentum strategy and, and compare your model to that. That seems to be, this would be the proper comparison. That's right? a good idea. I mean, we, essentially we can look at uh, the last 30 days to construct- Exactly, uh, something like- That would look yeah. like last yeah. high versus low based on the last 30 days, yeah. 60 yeah. days and so on. But I think that that would be in some sense Mm. I mean, I think I'm not surprised that a lot of these other factors, you know, they, they're more lower frequency factors, right? So in some sense, you, you, you're comparing a little bit apples to oranges, right? You have to figure out what would be the corresponding factors that, that matter for high, higher frequencies. I fully agree. I would not have expected to find anything because these factors are just capturing something different. Um, but then your, your, your benchmark here is not really, you know, appropriate. I think you could do better by mm -hmm. coming up with some very simple um, factors like short-term momentum and things like that. That would be, I would be curious to see how much, mm -hmm. how much better your model would be to a simple high frequency momentum or reversal or whatever is under, underneath this. That to me would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, we can certainly do that. Um, and yeah, that would be interesting. Um, coming back here, you know, there's a robustness, whatever I've shown you here holds if I look not only at five, but at eight or 10 and so on factors, everything carries over. But now the, the next question that comes back to Bob's point, um, what if, as a trader, I care about a large mean of my strategy? And because I have short selling constraints, I mean, I, the sharp ratio is less informative for me. So we argue, if you want to have a high mean, you need a mean objective function. So you can use the mean variance objective function to everything exactly the same as what we did before um, and estimate those models. Now here, just for the purpose of illustration, we pick a specific risk aversion. But what I want to show you is that these models can now achieve mean returns around 20% PCA-based residuals or IPCA-based residuals if I use five statistical factors. Of course, we will get lo somewhat lower sharp ratios, but we still get high sharp ratios. But the point is, if you care about sharp ratio, your objective should be sharp ratio. If your objective is mean return, you should estimate the model based on that objective. Um, so I think the bigger picture takeaway is even with a leverage constraint, you can achieve high mean returns. Now, <clears throat> what about the whole time theory signal discussion that I had before? So just big picture again. Um, the reason why we look at a time series filter of the data is because we care about relative movements. You know how prices from one peer to the other behave relative to each other. And a time series model is a model that captures dependencies between a lot of input variables. That's why it's so hard to do time series modeling. Um, you will see papers that say we apply machine learning and machine learning methods should learn everything, right? Because these are flexible models. So what happens if I construct my residuals the same way as before, I just apply this fast, uh, this uh, feed forward neural network directly to residuals without any time series model and then look at the performance. These models will collapse. They will be much, much worse than if I apply, for example, uh, the fast Fourier transformation. The reason is conventional time machine learning models are somewhat limited in the type of dependencies that they can learn between all the input variables. So if you have a time series problem, we need a time series solution for the problem. Now, the paper has tons of robustness tests. Um, for example, we show if we look at the last 60 days, we get roughly the same results. So whatever information we care about is already captured in the last 30 days. Um, instead of re-estimating the model um, on a rolling 
in window, we can also just use the first four years, estimate our models, and keep them constant for the next 16 years. We get slightly worse performance, around 30% decrease, but our models will still be better than the other benchmark models, even if those are estimated on a rolling window. So it means we can study this constant model to interpret what kind of structure do we actually get. Um, our results are extremely robust to all kinds of tuning parameters. And this is about a bigger picture point. It's more important how you set up the problem, but it doesn't matter that much how many layers you have and so on. That is not the key point here. I also want to emphasize uh, the different factor models that we use to construct residuals. If the performance is similar, it doesn't mean that the residuals are the same. Pharma French factors are not the same as PCA factors. I mean, there's a lot of evidence for that. Um, and if you look at the residuals obtained from different types of factor models, you see that they will be only weakly correlated. So there's actually room for additional diversification in that sense. But within a factor family, you more or less get the same residuals. I mean, if you use the residuals um, of five or eight PCAs, it's, kind of, it's a very similar structure you capture. And another bigger picture point is about when we talk about how much arbitrage is left uh, from a model, we typically look at unconditional means of residuals. I mean, these are alphas. Um, we just want to emphasize this is not a good measure to, to assess empirically how much information is taken out by an asset pricing model. If we look at the unconditional mean of our residuals, these are way smaller than 1% and um, many are non-significant. However, when you conditionally trade based on the time series patterns, you get these huge alphas and these large sharp ratios. So the point is, if you want to assess how much average is left, you need to assess the conditional mean of these residuals based on the time series pattern. All right, let me come to transaction costs. So we have one version of how we assess it in this paper. There are certainly more ways to do it, but this is just a simple way where we say, well, let's add to our objective function a cost, which is five basis points per transaction that we do. So we want to reduce turnover. And one basis point on top of that, if it's a short position. So we want to have more longs and short positions. If we re-estimate our model, and I'm just showing you here the IPCA model with our uh, convolutional transformer. I mean, not surprisingly, the out of sample sharp ratios will go down, right? <laughs> Now we will get a sharp ratio of one and a mean return of around five to 6%. But the point is we still get economic significant profitability even in the presence of trading costs. Um, I also want to emphasize these are lower bounds on our results because there are ways how we could impose sparsity in the way how we construct proxy factors to reduce turnover more. I mean, there are more sophisticated ways that we could attack the problem. This should just be seen as a lower bound there. You can actually use this in practice. So Marcus, now, um, is yes. one basis point a reasonable estimate of shorting costs? I would have thought it would be substantially higher than that. Um, we, well, this is a good discussion that we could have. We use these numbers because we're using a number of other papers. And so we refer to them as reasonable. Um, in, in the end, we could reassess it by increasing it. Um, and the question is how much can we increase them and still end up with a profitable uh, sharp ratio or mean return? That, that is a great I think those question. are reasonable. I would say, yeah. You think those are reasonable? I would say that one bit. Sorry? Julia, you think those are reasonable? I mean, I, I would def defer to you, but where yeah, I think one basis point is reasonable. Yeah, yeah. The one for basis short point for shorting cost is reasonable. Yes. But the, the five basis point might be unreasonable because, but it's like an average across 20 years. I think, you know, I, I looked at that and five beeps today is too high. And five bips, you know, beginning of the century would be too low. So I think it would be interesting if there was a kind of more variable trading cost depending on the year, but I think they are reasonable. But what about borrowing, borrowing costs? I mean, there's there's all kinds of fees. The and borrowing stuff. costs are fine because, 
yeah, the borrowing costs are okay. I mean, again, like it will depend on the individual position. I would be more interested to see how the solution actually selects the weights because what what tends to happen in these type of allocations is that one stock will be long and like everything else will be short, in which case certainly it will be unreasonable. Like if it is evenly spread, you can find you know, non-hard to borrow stocks, but it's always a question whether this is loading on hard to borrow securities in in any kind of trading selection or not. But on average, this is a, an okay uh, estimate because there's like, you know, the general collateral is generally 25 bips per year. Marcus, uh, can you remind me what kind of stocks um, are you using here? Um, we use it, the f- all stocks that have a, a market cap larger than 0.01% of the total market cap, which on average gives us 550 stocks per day. So the 550, on average, the 550 largest ones. Right. Now, it so could be in different some sense, number yeah, in different I mean, months, but... Um, yeah. So, so these, these are mostly larger stocks, right? Yeah, these are all large cap stocks. So I think when we talk about trading costs, um, we have to look at the universe of stocks that, that you are actually using in your sample. Yeah. So this is... Uh, and are, are these costs daily? So it's shorting is one basis point per day? Yeah. So okay. Okay. I, so I have that, a formula here, which just, I assign it to the weight that I get each day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now... And, 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 and can you say something about the actual turnover of the portfolio? So that would be the next slide. Um, So I think the more interesting part is how does an arbitrageur trade if they have trading costs versus if they don't have it. Um, So what I want to show here is the turnover. If we estimate our model, this will be the IPC5 model. Um, um, This is a turnover that we have if we don't have a trading friction objective. And that is the one with trading friction objective. And here we have the short allocations uh, without trading friction objective and with the objective. Um, I think the main point is it is very obvious. Uh, The uh, turnover that we have here will be lower if you have this in the objective, that's not surprising. We have 50% short positions in our uh, model um, that is estimated without any constraints. And the um, short positions go down up to 30% at the end of our sample if we have this in the objective. I think the interesting point is that our model adapts to exploit particularly profitable arbitrage time periods. So you could argue that during the financial time periods, during volatile markets, there are more arbitrage opportunities. Our model learns that it has larger short positions and it will trade more, but in later time periods, it can make a profit without trading that much and without having large short positions. So this comes back to this bigger picture point. If you want to assess how much you can get in a realistic environment, you need to include this in, in the objective of your problem. Now, I want to, this is the last part I have. I want to understand what is the economic structure that we estimate here. So I want to dissect our model. And what I will use will be the CNN plus transformer for IPCA5 residuals. I just want to pin down one benchmark model. And just to give you some intuition here, I look at two residuals. These are empirical residual times here so over this local 30 day window. And I sh- this light blue line shows you the cumulative residuals for these two examples. And the dark blue shows you how our model would trade. Now I'm showing you how our model would trade if it would only use this one residual. That's why we end up with weights between one and minus one. So we normalize it. So it's only trading one residual here, right? Uh, And here you see the profitability. So these two examples obviously work quite well to be profitable. The more interesting part is that I would say the first residual example has a somewhat of a mean reverting type pattern. And that seems to be exploited by our um, weights. But there are also these fine or fast mean reverting uh, movements you can see that our weight changes quite rapidly to capture also these very local patterns. The second example seems to be mainly a downward trend for around 15 days. And our model extracts the 
the right weight. So this will be a negative weight for most of this downward trend. But if there's slight changes, it changes quickly up and down. So, so the takeaway that we have from here is that we detect global, but also this local trend and reversal patterns. And we have the same plots in the paper for the other models. And none of the other more parametric models detect these very fast patterns. So the other models typically are constant for the first half, you know, buy the first and sell the second half. Um, now, let's dig a little bit deeper. So what is actually the Marcus, model? before we dig a li little bit deeper, I just want to mention we're at 1220, and uh, I don't know if there's going to be a lot of questions for the audience. So um, give me five minutes, and yeah. then. Oh then I will sum it up. So what is the pattern that we learned? So as a reminder, our flexible time series model has two elements, these local filters, that's what we call CNN. And these are the eight local filters that we learn. And they're all these, what I call trend reversal type patterns locally, but none of them are really spiked. So what we the way how we interpret is that we get relatively smooth trend and mean reversion patterns locally. That means every vector, let's say a 30 dimensional vector of a residual will be mapped into a 30 times eight matrix, how it is exposed to these patterns. And then we have these global pattern factors. And that is a little bit harder to visualize. So the way, so we will have four global patterns and to learn a little bit what, we uh, what the structure is, we will feed in a simulated sinus into our empirically learned model. And we want to see how these global patterns look like. Now, if I feed in this sinus here, I get this structure for the global patterns, for the global factors. And the force, the red factor, we label it a negative the reversal factor because it's negative if we have a positive realization and it's positive if we have a negative realization. Now, what is interesting is a green global pattern. So if we have a positive um, residual at the beginning of our time series, the green pattern is activated, and then it tracks very much like a reversal type pattern, the same pattern that we have in the input. However, if we don't have a positive value at the beginning of our 30-day window, the green pattern is not activated, it will stay silent. And then the blue attention weight pattern, we call it a low frequency downturn factor. It's like a dampened version of the red line. Now, how would this look like for an empirical residual? So this is just a representative residual. So this is how it looks like over 30 days. Um, now we represent this 30 dimensional vector in terms of how it's exposed to this CNN, these local filters. So just as a reminder, filter one, was about downturn events. And what you can see is on day 27, there's a large downturn. So filter one is activated. That's why you see a spike here. And I could apply the same interpretation to the other spikes here because that is where the specific pattern appears in the data. And now these are these global pattern functions. And the red one, remember this was a negative reversal pattern. It's low if my input is high, it's high if my input is low. And the green one is only activated if I have a positive uh, residual at the beginning. And that's the case, so we activate this positive reversal pattern. Now, this was a one day example. So what if I look at the same stock, but for the whole 16 years, right? So before I looked at one glimpse and now I glue this together and look at it over time. Now, what I'm showing you here, this four heat maps are these, these plots that you have here, but now for each day, right? So this is uh, like the weights that you have for the 30 day windows, uh, but for different days. And so what you can see in the global times here, there are some days or some time years like 2009, 2014, 2016, where you arguably have downturn events. And that's exactly when my uh, negative reversal factor four seems to have the highest weights, the highest activation. So that is when you have this lighter color, that means it is much more pronounced during those time periods. And the third attention head weight, that's a green um, weight from the first one, uh, from the slide before, 
that is activated in 2007 when we have an upturn, 2010 when things go up, 2012 when things go up. And that is exactly when we have the largest weights. Now, what is more interesting is when the force pattern is activated, it puts most weights on the last 10 days. Um, and that is in line with that this negative effect for negative downturn movements, what matters most are the last 10 days. For up movements, and that would be captured by my third pattern, those are activated mainly based on the first 20 days. There's very little weight put on the, the end. So up trends are activated if something happened in the past, like 20 days ago. Um, related to this, we can look at variable importance plots. So I can just look at the average absolute gradient of these allocation weights relative to the last 30 days or relative to the basic patterns. So if I look to the basic patterns, then what I see is that basic pattern two doesn't really matter for my trading. Basic pattern two was a flat line. Yeah, so that is not surprising. So flat lines are not something we trade on. Um, on the other hand, if I look at which days matter, the largest weights will be on the most recent days, but it seems that some days in the past also matter and keep in mind that we have this asymmetric trading rules. So it seems like for some trading rules, what matters are also what happens in the first 10 or 15 days of my local look back window. So let me wrap up here. So this paper provides a unifying conceptual framework of how to think about statistical arbitrage and separates into these three elements, portfolio generation, signal extraction, allocation decision. And then we study each of these elements and we propose a novel solution for each of these elements, namely conditional latent factor model to generate arbitrage portfolios. This novel CNN plus transformer model to capture time series dependency. And then a flexible rule of how to trade based on this time series uh, signal based on global objective functions. And empirically we show out of sample that our model performs really well that our results are unspanned with at least the conventional risk factors. Um, it survives realistic transaction and holding costs. And we can learn about the structure of arbitrage trading, that it is actually based on trend and reversion patterns, but there are some asymmetries um, and interesting patterns. Um, and last but not least, we can make a statement of what is really the hard problem when it comes to stats arbitrage. And we say it's how to deal with time series data how to extract a signal. That seems to be the distinguishing factor. I will stop here and thank you so much for listening. And I will be here if you have more questions. So uh, thank you, Marcus. And uh, let's thank the speaker, everybody, for a really wonderful talk. Um, let's see, so uh, I want to applaud. And uh, wonder if there are questions uh, beyond what we've already uh, heard from the audience. Hey, Marcus, I have, I a, have question. a question. Yeah, we have yeah. questions. <laughs> so Marcus on the architecture. So uh, it's a very interesting uh, study, I think. Um, when you show transformer architecture, if you can scroll to that slide, I don't know, it may take a long time to answer. Uh, I will ask the shorter version. Do you have like maybe a GitHub code or some kind of, information we can glean from how this network has been constructed all the way through. And on that slide, my question would be how, what's the, how do you apply the fit forward network to the result of the transformer? Very good questions. Um, first, so my students uh, cleaned up and documented the code. Uh, we have not made it public yet uh, because we want to test it, uh, make sure uh, that the cleaned version is nice to use. Uh, but we'll make it public together with the data so that everyone can replicate our paper um, and you can play around with the code and change it if you like. Um, coming back to um, there. Yeah, the, hmm? there was there, the, the slide on the transformer. There, um, uh, for those people who are in uh, the data science, computer science community, um, when you build a transformer, then the last element of a transformer is applying some kind of, usually a feed-forward neural network to map your transformer output into whatever output, final output you want to have. Uh, we have 
artificially separate these two elements because our signal, our allocation function, signal function are, are I mean, are artificially separated here. I mean, in the end, the estimation is just one combined model. The reason why we did this artificial separation is because we wanted to compare it with the other benchmark models that we have to have a conceptual view on the problem. But in the end, the output, it, it, in, so if you look at a classical paper about transformer, this feed-forward neural network is labeled as being part of the transformer. Um, so mathematically speaking, um, the output are these attention heads. That means for each residual, I will get um, a, a four, actually a four times eight dimensional matrix because they're different basis. Uh, um, these local filters and I apply them to this matrix. So in the end I get a, sorry, I need to be careful. Um, no, I will get for each residual a four dimensional vector. Um, and that I feed into the feed forward neural network here. But it's estimated as a combined problem. Um, does this help? Yes, somewhat, because on your picture, maybe the picture is misleading because you have a matrix, you have a two dimensional vector output for each residual right here. It looks like it's D by L, and then you apply some linear layer to that, to each. Okay row so, of that matrix on, on the right and the yeah. very end yeah so th there is here is essentially the structure for estimating this function this is what i said before that there is a low dimensional structure imposed implicitly um, i've did a lot of hand waving here so i didn't really explain what we do here and in the end um what we we might that is the place i'm asking yeah. about, right where so, you're showing the, the um, I only, okay, this plot here would show you this matrix, not only for the dependency between the last observed value and all the past ones, but this shows you a matrix for the second to last observed and so on. But what we use for our model will only be the dependency on the last observed value. Got it. That is why we're Thank taking you. only the last element here. So in some way, we could have taken this whole element out. It was more like this is how it was introduced in the original papers about transformers. That's why we use this. Mm -hmm. but, um, we cut off of a matrix uh, only the last stuff that relates. And that makes the one dimensional vector. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. And you said that it will be available to just kind of ponder over the architecture for there this. There will be a GitHub code available that you can use, and we want to upload the data as well so you can execute it. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, with that, um, I will call uh, this session to a, to a close because we're a little bit over. Uh, thank you again, Marcus, for a fantastic uh, talk. I'm certainly want to get in touch afterwards to understand some of the details better and also talk about trading costs because um, I'm certainly uh, curious how we come to the one basis point. But um, next week uh, at this very same time, uh, Bob Anderson will be presenting. And Bob, I don't have your title or an abstract. Are you ready to say what they are or is everyone going to be surprised? Uh, You're so on mute. I'm unmuted now. So I, uh, I don't have the title right in front of me, but it concerns um, uh, equilibrium models uh, designed for uh, global warming in particular with uh, um, negative externalities and, and bads. So okay. good, good that give negative utility to everyone. Great. Well, um, look forward to that. Hope to see many of you next week. And uh, till then, um, have a have a, a, a good uh, a, a good a good week to everybody. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye.